Um, I'm also here with my colleague, Bill Riley. He's also with Dwayne Morrison Heckscher. Uh, he has a sophisticated technology and computer background. He founded the first online secure website in Denmark in a prior life. And here we go. Um, by the way, if you want to have any further detailed information uh, on us or some of our work, we recently published a law review article on cybercrime legal, legal issues. You can find that at my website, sinrodlaw.com. That's S-I-N-R-O-D-L-A-W.com. The article is there, along with the uh, weekly uh, cyber law column that I write, as well as other information. Today, we're going to provide you with an overview of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. That is the, the primary statute uh, in this country that deals with uh, computer criminal issues. We've also brought along 200 handouts, which obviously are not enough. They're the blue handouts that give you the most relevant portions of the statute. Um, by the way, you can find out more information about this statute at the website I gave you a moment ago. Um, this statute was enacted in 1986. Uh, computer crime was perceived as a growing issue in the mid-1980s, and Congress essentially had a choice. Congress either could have attempted to update traditional criminal laws, such as burglary, while engrafting onto them uh, computer crime provisions, or it could write an entirely new statute, which it decided to do, as I mentioned, in 1986. And this turned out to be a wise choice, at least in the view of Congress and, uh, and lawyers, because the statute flexibly uh, can be uh, amended over time and frankly has been amended several times since 1986, uh, for example, relating to issues of criminal intent uh, and the like. The statute was most recently amended in 1996, and there are some further proposed amendments currently pending in Congress that Bill will, will be speaking with you about uh, shortly. Um, there are seven major features of the statute in terms of uh, creating potential criminal liability. And I'll go through these in a little more detail in a moment, but let me just tick them off for you. And these are also contained in the handouts, which some of you have. Uh, the first uh, potential uh, item of criminal activity has to do with espionage. The next is improperly obtaining information. Next is improper access to government computers. That's a biggie. Uh, next has to do with fraud. The next one is transmission of a program, information, code, or a command which causes damage. And we'll be talking about the definition of damage because that's important as to whether or not you've actually committed a crime. Uh, when I say you, I use that term loosely and generically. I'm not looking at anybody in particular out here. Uh, and then we also have extortion. Uh, the statute also cr creates potential civil liability. If someone is guilty of a statutory violation, they also can be sued for that conduct in court, and they can be hit with economic damages and requests for injunctive relief. Um, as a side note, uh, at times it is perceived that some perpetrators of uh, cybercrime don't have deep pockets. Uh, they don't have financial resources. So what do victims do in terms of getting recompense? Uh, for example, in the context of distributed denial of service attacks, uh, some of the uh, attacks were perpetrated through uh, zombie sites. And now that there's been quite a bit of publicity regarding the massive DDoS attacks in February, uh, an argument could be made against a zombie site for not having taken reasonable protective measure, measures to protect its systems. And to the extent a, an attack travels through a zombie site, that zombie site might be on the uh, receiving end of a civil lawsuit under the theory of negligence. Um, I also want to mention that there, is now, there are now being written special internet-related insurance policies. Traditional insurance policies generally cover losses to uh, tangible physical property. Uh, that's not normally the case when you have losses of data in cyberspace. And these new policies are being written to cover uh, cyber crimes and other issues on the internet. Uh, interestingly, uh, a federal judge in Arizona recently held that pure data loss can be covered under traditional insurance policies because the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which I'm talking about today, uh, equates data loss with uh, damage to property. And that was an interesting decision because it was an insurance case that followed a criminal statute as opposed to uh, insurance coverage precedent. 
It's not entirely clear yet how or whether Congress wanted the statute to apply to commercial enterprises. And I'll just point out one uh, quick example. Uh, Real Jukebox was just uh, sued in a, a class action lawsuit. Um, the allegation is that the Real Jukebox software, uh, which plays uh, music on a computer, uh, snooped on the plaintiffs once they installed the software on their computers. The allegation is that each time someone ran the Real Jukebox software program, information allegedly was sent surreptitiously to Real Network's computers. Such information allegedly included, one, the type of computer format the mu music is stored in, two, the quality level of the recordings, three, the class member's musical preferences, and four, the type of portable music player, if any, the class member has connected to the computer. Uh, the plaintiffs are claiming that Real Networks violated a certain section of the statute, and I'll be going through this in a moment, by taking information from their computers that exceeded Real Network's uh, proper authorization. Uh, we will see how this one plays out, pardon the pun. So let's get down to the real meat of the statute. Uh, and you can see this in the handout, but the first provision is Section A1, uh, having to do with espionage. And this part of the statute is triggered if someone knowingly uh, accesses a computer uh, and obtains information that the United States government has deemed uh, highly sensitive, such as information relating to uh, national defense and foreign relation issues, and then willfully communicates that information to somebody else who does not have authorization to have that information, or willfully fails to give the information back to the federal government upon request. What's the penalty? Up to 10 years in prison for a first offense, and up to 20 years if it's a repeat offense. So Congress obviously takes this one fairly seriously. The next prong that I mentioned has to do with wrongfully obtaining information, and this is subsection A2 of the statute. This part of the statute is triggered if someone intentionally accesses a computer without authorization or exceeds authorized access and thereby obtains information. It's fairly open. Um, the penalty for this is up to one year in prison uh, and up to 10 years for repeat offender. Um, if this was done for purposes of commercial advantage or private financial gain, the first offense can be up to five years in prison as opposed to one year. Section A3 uh, deals with accessing a government computer. Here this, the statute is triggered if someone intentionally, without authorization, simply accesses a United States computer. There's no further requirement. You don't have to obtain information or do anything with it. You simply gain access to a government computer. Uh, so this one is triggered like a hair trigger. And the uh, first offense can be up to one year in prison, and a repeat offense uh, can be up to 10 years in prison. Next is subsection A4 under the statute. Uh, this has to do with fraud. And this part of the statute is triggered if someone uh, with intent to defraud uh, accesses a protected computer and furthers the intended fraud by obtaining anything of value unless, and this part is carved out of the statute, um, this activity consists only of the use of the computer, only of the use of the computer, and the value of such use is not more than $5,000 in a one year period. So minor activity, if you will, is not part of the triggering aspect of this part of the statute. Uh, next is subsection A5, and I know I'm going through a laundry list here, I'm almost done, thank you for bearing with me, uh, has to do with hacking, uh, viruses, and denial of service. And this part of the statute is triggered by someone knowingly causing the transmission of a program, information, code, or a command which intentionally causes damage uh, to a protected computer. Uh, this can land you in jail for five years on a first offense, or ten years if it's a repeat offense. Moving down a level, uh, this part of the statute uh, creates a penalty for doing the same thing but recklessly causing damage as opposed to intentionally causing damage. Same penalty, however, uh, five years or ten years for a repeat offense. And then finally, uh, the same type of con conduct, whether it's intentional, reckless or not, if you just happen to do it with no intent whatsoever uh, and you do cause damage, you still can find yourself in jail up to one year for a first offense, and again, 10 years for a repeat offense. 
Uh, Section A6 of the statute is triggered when someone knowingly and with the intent to defraud traffics in passwords. Uh, this can uh, create uh, a prison term of one year for a first offense and 10 years for a repeat offense. And then last but not least uh, is uh, the, a part of the statute dealing with extortion. And if someone with the attempt to extort uh, anything of value uh, communicates uh, any sort of a message which contains a threat to cause damage to a protected computer, uh, you're in the hot seat, uh, five years for a first offense, 10 years for a repeat offense. Now, the provision dealing with hacking, uh, viruses, denial of service, and extortion uh, keys off on the word damage. And I mentioned that a moment ago. Damage is defined in the statute as $5,000 in losses in a given year, or harm to the provision of medical care, uh, creating physical injury, or threatening public health or safety. So if you're not dealing with medical care, physical injury, or health or safety, uh, you're not causing statutory damage if the harm you cause, again, generically you, uh, is less than $5,000. So the quantification of a loss is quite important under this statute. And as Bill will discuss later on, there are some proposed amendments that touch on that particular issue. All right, so where do we go from here in this discussion? You've heard all the legal gobbledygook from the statute. We thought we'd try to bring it on home with some hypothetical examples. Uh, we're first going to discuss three different types of hacks that could trigger different parts of the statute. Uh, the first one is a basic root level hack. And by the way, I'll do a little footnote right now. I don't purport to be a technical expert like many of you are here. Uh, I'm a lawyer, but I'll do the best I can. Bill has somewhat more expertise than I do on the technical matters, but again, uh, he said we say something, it's not absolutely perfect as a matter of technology. Please forgive us. We were trained elsewhere. Um, the first one is a basic root level hack. Uh, here, the perpetrator uh, plants a sniffer, uh, browses private files, uh, erases log tracks, uh, places a back door, and gives passwords to friends. And so we're setting up a few uh, hurdles here, and we'll see how they trigger the statute. The second hack we're going to look at, uh, you have someone creating a web page that contains code that can exploit, for example, vulnerabilities in ActiveX. And then the third hack we're going to look at deals with someone who is authorized, but exceeds his authorization, penetrates a system, encrypts some files, and then tries to extort money from corporate management for the decrypting key. Then, uh, if time permits, we're going to look at criminal liability uh, for distributed denial of service attacks and the launch of malicious worms. Uh, finally, we're going to touch on the uh, legislative proposals to amend the statute, and we're going to talk about what's happening legally in the rest of the world on the cybercrime front. Uh, without further ado, I'm now going to turn it over to Bill, and he's going to spin the first factual hypothetical for you. Thank you. Hey. Yeah, I'm going to set up the, uh, the basic techniques that Bob, this car, hypothetical perpetrator, for lack of a better word, uh, he's going to use to kind of get himself into all kinds of trouble. And I'm not going to go into the real details of the exploits. You guys are going to hear enough about that, about the other uh, breakout sessions throughout the weekend. Um, but I want to walk you quickly through the various things that trigger the different areas of this dynamic statute, because it really is. Uh, it's, a, it's actually very broad and encompassing, and it's actually going to get much more that way if they pass the intended legislation that's going on in Washington. Uh, so some of the things that he, he's doing in this way, it's uh, maybe they're not the most realistic way, but what, I just want to be able, just for illustration purposes, to be able to show you what different uh, parts of the statute are uh, triggered. So also on my part, you don't have to take notes, because Eric's going to cover the, uh, the exact same points the way that I do it. So the first one, as Eric mentioned, is the uh, traditional hack, which is a remote penetration of a third party's computer. And so in this hack, what, hack, what uh, Bob, or, uh, he's going to exploit an old SendMail 883 uh, bug, and so he's going to uh, sign on for a trial shell account at an ISP. And uh, with the shell access, he's going to tell him that into the, uh, into the shell account and enter a series of commands to exploit the SendMail program. Um, He's going to uh, create a link to the, uh, the etc slash password directory, and he's going to get, a, hopefully, for, uh, for Bob, a password-free account. And once he has uh, root access, his next, act, his next objective is to uh, download 
uh, the, uh, any uh, passwords that might be located on the system. And then, of course, the next thing he's going to do is going to plant a sniffer. And uh, he's going to plant the sniffer to uh, listen to all the TCP IP network traffic. And so in this scenario, Bob's going to get about 5,000 web accesses. And within that, he's going to troll, uh, he's going to be able to get some uh, UU encoded passwords. And then, so once he's on root access, he decides to take a tour through the server. And he starts looking to see if uh, anyone on the uh, server might have been dumb enough to be able to leave uh, credit card information, for example, like in a CGI BIM directory. And he's also looking around for hidden files and hidden directories. And then, of course, he's going to want to, uh, uh, he doesn't want to uh, leave the digital footprints all over the server. So he's going to locate the real log file and uh, carefully erase his tracks. And, uh, of course, he doesn't want all of his hard work to go to waste, so he's going to plant a back door on the system. And uh, then finally, Bob uh, has his passwords, he's going to decrypt them, and he's going to email them to uh, several of his friends uh, free of charge. So Eric's going to explain you now about the trouble that uh, Bob just got himself into. The trouble with Bob. Okay, let's talk about Bob and what he's done. <clears throat> Has Bob been a bad boy? We'll find out. <laughs> All right. Uh, if the computer that Bob uh, accessed is private or a protected computer, uh, which essentially in the statute is defined as any computer that is used in interstate or foreign commerce, basically any computer hooked up to the internet, then Bob could have some criminal liability. Uh, if he gained the information for commercial advantage, or if the information is part of a larger criminal act, or if the value of the information exceeded $5,000, then good old Bob could be liable for a felony and up to five years in the slammer. Otherwise, Bob still might face some misdemeanor liability. If we're dealing with uh, Bob and a governmental computer, uh, he certainly is likely, uh, certainly likely, he is certainly was liable for a misdemeanor at least, uh, even if he does not obtain any information. And I went over that a little bit earlier. Um, if Bob uh, obtained the information from a computer that was operated by a financial institution, uh, then he also is most likely uh, criminally liable for a, a misdemeanor. Uh, there are special protections put into the statute for financial institutions. Can everybody hear me okay? All right. Um, now let's talk about Bob and planting a sniffer. Uh, this probably is a serious violation of Section A5A uh, if the damage caused is over $5,000. Uh, the damage can be calculated a number of ways. Uh, it could include the amount of engineering time needed to uh, deal with the situation, downtime, and harm to the sniffer. Excuse me, to the system, not to the sniffer. Uh, finally, uh, at a minimum, uh, it is a misdemeanor to plant a sniffer because uh, the information uh, was obtained without, because information was obtained without authorization. Now let's talk about Bob's browsing of private files. Again, if we're dealing with a government computer and sensitive information, uh, there are some harsh penalties in place. Congress did not take lightly the issue of uh, deal, uh, tampering with government secrets. Uh, and if this is the case, uh, old Bob could have a prison term of up to 10 years. Uh, if with knowledge he transmitted uh, governmental secret information to others or he refused to give back the information upon demand. Uh, if the information is not sensitive, but Bob nevertheless went ahead and browsed files, uh, he's likely committed a misdemeanor uh, unless the value of the information uh, exceeds $5,000 or he did this uh, for commercial gain, uh, then he's in the realm of uh, felonies. Excuse me. And this is all in the governmental computer context. In terms of a uh, private computer, uh, Bob is going to find himself criminally liable if his activities uh, furthered an intended fraud uh, or if he obtained anything of value. Now, it's sometimes worthwhile to look at some of the cases that have interpreted the statute to see how the sta statute's really playing out uh, in real life. Uh, one case I point to is called United States versus Zubinsky. It's C-Z-U-B-I-N-S-K-Y. And this case deals with what constitutes anything of value uh, under the uh, fraud section of the statute, Section A4. In that particular case, uh, Zubinsky uh, worked for an IRS office. Um, he uh, then conducted numerous unauthorized searches of IRS files in his spare time. The court held, uh, not surprisingly, that this exceeded the scope of his authorized access. However, the court concluded that Zubinsky did not obtain anything of value 
because he merely viewed the information and he did nothing with it. Therefore, in this particular case, his felony conviction was reversed, and this was one client that was happy with his attorney. It does happen once in a while. Another case I want to point to is AOL versus LCGM. Now remember, under a Section G of the statute, uh, private civil lawsuits can be um, filed against people alleged to have violated the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Uh, in this particular case, AOL used Section A2C of the statute uh, having to do with improper access and gaining of information against LCGM. Uh, LCGM was alleged to have sent unsolicited bulk email, otherwise known affectionately as spam, uh, to AOL subscribers. Uh, LCGM admitted to maintaining an AOL membership and using the membership to harvest AOL email messages. Uh, as such, LCGM violated the terms of service uh, and uh, exceeded the scope of its authorization. The court held that LC LCGM did violate the statute by obtaining information from AOL's protected computer system. Uh, AOL did not get damages in that case, but did receive injunctive relief preventing this type of practice from going forward in the future. Okay, now getting back to Bill's hypothetical, uh, what about erasing log tracks and placing a back door? Um, if the erasing of the log tracks and placing the wet back door uh, was part of a fraudulent scheme, then Bob probably is looking at a felony and time in prison. Um, when Bob erased the server access logs, he's damaged the system, and then the question comes down to whether the damage cost was over $5,000, and we talked about that monetary threshold before. One more case here, uh, which I think you might find interesting, is U.S. versus Sablon, S-A-B-L-A-N. Uh, this was a mid-1990s case which explored issues of intent under the statute. Uh, Sablon worked for a bank in Guam uh, and had been recently uh, dismissed from her employment. After a night on the town, uh, she left the bar, entered the bank through an unlocked door, and using her old password, she entered onto the system and destroyed some files. Uh, she argued that she didn't intend to cause any damage to the files and therefore did not meet the intent element of Section A5. How many people here think that she succeeded with this argument? <laughs> well, let's see what happened. Uh, the court held that intent refers to intent to access, not intent to damage, and therefore she was off the hook. This part of the statute has since been amended, and it does require intent to cause damage to uh, the files and the like. Now, what about giving passwords to friends? Uh, here, Bob will be liable if the court finds that he knowingly and with intent uh, to defraud trafficked in passwords. Uh, the term traffic simply means that Bob or anyone else has passed on passwords to somebody else. All right, now let's turn to the next uh, hypothetical, and I turn it over to Bill. Okay, this, is a, this has never been litigated before, and the government hasn't brought any actions against it, so it's purely hypothetical. But in this, situ in this uh, scenario, we're going to look at the criminal liability for posting an exploitive web page that can allow the web page author to execute uh, local files on the visitor's computer. And it's, this is a, it's a real unique look at the flexibility of, uh, of 1030, because you know, what happens if you post a website and the, uh, with the malicious code and somebody goes to you, it's kind of like a reverse hack. Uh, so what's the liability? It's because the hacker doesn't specifically target his victim, and nor does he, uh, he directly penetrate the victim's computer. Uh, but rather the victim visits the web page himself and downloads the file uh, if several conditions are met, then it can potentially violate the uh, integrity of the victim's computer. So the way this one works is a hacker constructs a malicious help file uh, and places it in a location that's accessible, uh, accessible by the victim, which uh, causes the help file to be loaded and then embedded uh, shortcuts, execute uh, without interaction from the victim, the guy who visited the website. So a hacker causes the uh, compiled HTML help file to be opened through the ActiveX scripting show help uh, call on the Internet Explorer. And so by using the show help uh, active scripting call in conjunction with the shortcuts that are embedded in the malicious help file, uh, Bob here is able to execute all the programs 
uh, and active rent controls of his choice. So, uh, what's the liability, Eric? There's a sage wallower in the office and the audience right now. Could you please come up for an important message? Thanks. You heard about the terrorists that uh, hijacked a plane full of uh, lawyers and they were sitting on the tarmac and the terrorist said, if you don't meet my demand for $5 million, I'm going to start releasing the attorneys. So <laughs> I break things up a little bit. All right, we're back to Bob. Uh, Bob, in terms of the scenario that uh, Bill just painted, uh, Bob may be liable uh, for the mere, uh, well, they, Bob, I'm tripping over my own tongue here, Bob may not be liable simply for the mere passive posting of a malicious website because what if nobody visits the site? Uh, the statute primarily concerns itself with the unauthorized acquisition of information, uh, damage to computer systems or fraudulent activity where something of value has been obtained. Uh, a passive website does none of these things. But what if the site is no longer passive and it's visited um, and a file is secretly placed on a victim's computer? Um, access of a government computer, as we've seen, is enough to trigger the statute. So if someone in the government uh, goes to the website and then something secretly placed on a government computer, Bob's got trouble. Uh, if we're dealing with a non-governmental computer, uh, there is still potential criminal liability and, and even tort liability. There's the, what's called the trespass to chattels uh, civil theory, which basically is a, a common form of a trespass where this guy right here takes my, takes my uh, notebook and I've got valuable information there. That's a trespass. The uh, theory of trespass is now uh, becoming uh, part of cyber law. I don't know how many people here are familiar with the uh, eBay versus Bitter's Edge case that was recently decided in San Jose, but Bitter's Edge is a, an aggregator auction site that brings together multiple auction sites in one place so that people can bid simultaneously uh, at these different sites. And eBay uh, sued Bitter's Edge, arguing that the way Bitter's Edge crawled onto the uh, eBay servers and extracted information was essentially a trespass, and the court agreed. Uh, that case is shooting up like a rocket on appeal. Getting back to Bob, uh, if the malicious code affects a medically oriented computer or threatens public safety, then irrespective of dollar amount of damage, uh, Bob could find himself guilty of a felony and in prison for uh, five years. Um, by launching malicious code from the website, uh, as Bill's pointed out, you can't necessarily reduce your risk by choosing which computers are affected. Uh, as we previously discussed, the owner of a computer often affects the criminal liability, whether you're dealing with the government or not, for example. For example. Um, so there you have it. Um, if information uh, is obtained from a private computer as part of this practice, again, uh, Bob could face at least a uh, misdemeanor uh, based on the sections we previously discussed. All right, now let's go to the scenario where someone has authorized access but exceeded that authorization. Okay, this is one of the most common things that happens. They say 60 to 70 percent of all uh, corporate intrusions are done by people who exceed their authority. So uh, Bob here now is he's employed a large consulting company, and the consulting company uses mobile network, network, and uh, so. However, the, the network security is really lax, and uh, the uh, Nobel's uh, intruder detection system has not been turned on. So what Hacker does, he goes to a terminal that's in an unoccupied office, and he's going to uh, use a program called Nobel B uh, BFH, and he's going to try and run a series of uh, 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 passwords like AAABAC until eventually, with uh, Bob's luck, he's going to be able to at least uh, eventually get a password he can access the system. And so once he logs on under a different name, then he's going to place a keystroke logger uh, in the workstation's path and uh, collect the passwords in the uh, logger file. And so once he accesses, once he has access to several different passwords, then he uh, thinks it's going to be pretty interesting to start combing through uh, the personal emails of, uh, of his coworkers. And then he thinks, well, you know, I can actually make some money here. So using his uh, mobile hacking skills, and so he's going to uh, access critical files uh, and encrypt the directories. And uh, he wants to be able to uh, sell the decrypting key to management for 50,000 bucks in this case. 
So to do this, he has to get a sysadmin access, and uh, he's going to use a program called uh, MWHack uh, to execute a really blunt attack. And of course, it's not to uh, make the changes at this point, but he just wants to be able to get uh, administrator access. And uh, what he's going to do is he's going to just briefly uh, plant a back door so he can come back later. And so a few days later, he's going to go back into the system, and he's going to encrypt the directories, and he's going to send surprise management a uh, uh, demand for $50,000 for the decrypting key. So Eris can explain the trouble that Bob has gotten himself into now. Should I leave with one more lawyer joke? Should we go straight to Bob? Lawyer joke? Okay. Lawyer dies. I know. You're sad. Very sad. Let's all hang on that. Lawyer dies. He, he doesn't go to heaven. What a shock. Lawyer's in that nether region, very warm down there, and uh, he meets Satan, and Satan says, well, you know, the bad news is, yes, you're in hell, but you have three choices. Uh, you can go into cave number one, cave number two, or cave number three for eternity. The lawyer says, well, I don't know anything about the caves. Will you show me around? <laughs> sure, I'll give you a guided tour. And the lawyer's shown the first cave, and in the first cave, you have a lawyer that's, you know, being drawn and quartered repeatedly, indefinitely, you know, limbs being torn apart, put back together. Doesn't look very pleasant. Lawyer says, I've got to take a pass on cave number one. I don't like that action at all. Cave number two, uh, he looks in, and there's a lawyer who's being incinerated constantly, over and over again, being burned up. Lawyer's not too pleased with that prospect and takes a pass on cave number two and crosses his fingers and just hopes and prays that cave number three will be a little bit better. I won't go into any graphic detail here, but in cave number three, there's a lawyer with Monica Lewinsky. And our lawyer, we'll call him Bob, says, well, cave number three looks okay. And Satan, please, put me into cave number three. And so uh, Satan says, okay, fine. Monica, your turn's up. Come on in, lawyer. Take a place. <laughs> Get what you pay for. <laughs> All right, we are back to Bob. Uh, Bill makes a very good point, and that is uh, insider threats to uh, computer security really are the greatest threats. Uh, I'm not sure corporate America is fully aware of that yet. There's so much concern about outsiders hacking in. But uh, studies have shown, recent studies, and these were actually cited in the Law Review article that Bill and I wrote, that uh, most uh, uh, actual cyber crimes committed by insiders. Um, let's go back to the Zubinsky case with reference to Bob. Uh, if the employee is only looking at files, the employee may not face liability uh, under the section of the statute that deals with uh, loss of something of value. And remember how the uh, court decided that particular case. However, if an employee is looking at private emails, um, this could be deemed obtaining information under one of the subsections that I read you, and that could be enough to uh, trigger criminal liability. Uh, this particular legal theory hasn't played out fully, and we'll see where that goes. Uh, in terms of uh, Bob changing passwords to critical data, that appears to fear, fall squarely within the statute that I read to you earlier, and Bob could have a felony violation there in a prison term of up to five years. Uh, if Bob changes password access on a computer that could threaten public safety or medical services, then the prosecution in that particular instance would not need to meet the five hundred, excuse me, the five thousand uh, dollar damage threshold. Uh, however, in this particular scenario, it is likely that the five thousand dollar requirement is met because of the amount of ransom money that's being asked for here. There's got to be some sort of. Uh, 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 how do you say, a linkage between the dollar amounts. Uh, in terms of demanding the $50,000 in exchange for the password, uh, this could be a violation, uh, very likely a violation of subsection A7 of the statute. Uh, again, that talks about um, acting with the intent to extort from any person any money or thing of value by threatening to cause damage to a protected computer. And now we're on to DDoS attacks and Mr. Bill Riley. Um, let's do that one and skip over the worms. All right. Do it quickly. I'll just deal with this really quickly. You guys are probably pretty familiar with the distributed denial of service attacks that happened in uh, February. But the question is, is what's the criminal liability then for distributed denial of service? And uh, so what Bob wants to do is he just wants to be able to stage a large scale distributed denial of service attack and using, for example, this one, Stockhold Drop, and which I'm sure everybody in this room is familiar with. And so in the mass intrusion phase, he's going to uh, use his tools to be able to put 
the uh, to root compromise the large numbers of computers for the daemons, and then he's uh, going to control several of the masters using those encrypting clients. And so, what he's going to do is uh, uh, he's basically going to use the daemons to launch a large number of uh, packets flooding against the targeted victims. Uh, really, uh, yeah, it's probably not much. Yeah. Make this very very simple and short. Um, in terms of uh, uh, employing a typical uh, denial of service attack and planting the uh, masters and daemons, uh, at this stage the hacker's penetration has satisfied part of the elements of section A5 of the statute uh, because he's caused the transmission of a program. But again, we need to see some damage being caused under this part of the statute, and that hasn't happened yet. Uh, however, once the daemons, daemons launch a large number of packet flooding or other attacks against the targeted victims, then the damage is in, ensues and can be quite phenomenal, and the statute uh, is there and criminal liability can follow. Uh, we're going to skip over worm launches. I know you're terribly disappointed, but what can we do? We have some time constraints here. Uh, we're next going to talk about um, proposed changes to the statute. Uh, Bill's going to go over that quickly. Then I will tell you what's going on in the rest of the world quickly, and then we'll wrap up. What if Bob is in Iraq? Uh, that's a very good question, and that's going to go to a comment made in a moment about the harmonization of laws internationally. So if I can hold on and get to that in a moment. Thank you. Yeah. Excuse me. I don't know if uh, you're really familiar with what's going on in Washington right now, but there's two major bills that are working its way through the Senate, and actually they're in the House Judiciary Committee right now, that will dramatically uh, change the way uh, 1030A uh, is being uh, played out. The one is, I don't know if you know, one the numbers, but it's uh, S2448 uh, uh, by Orrin Hatch, and the other one is uh, S2092 by John Kyle. And I think one of the major uh, changes that they're making to the code here is if you can look on this little thing here, if underneath the hacking and the virus uh, and denial of service, what the thing is is that they have the definition here, it has to be intentionally causes damage in order to be able to invoke, and the damage is $5,000 for the uh, liability. But damage, a lot of times, you know, if you're just accessing information, or through, the courts have had a difficult time trying to determine what is damage. So what they're doing, or actually the first part that they're changing here, is a little bit strange. But uh, one is uh, if the defendant used or attempted to use a person less than 18 years of age to commit the offense, and that's, uh, that's a felony that's going to be very serious. But also, the, here is what they've done. They've changed the definition from damage to loss. So if the offense causes a loss as opposed to the damage, and uh, to one or more uh, people in, during a one-year period, it causes uh, $5,000 in damage. And that's the same thing, but the definition for loss is really broad. It says that it means that any reasonable cost to any victim, which is obviously wide open, including the cost of responding to the offense, conducting a damage assessment, and restoring the data, program, system, or information to its condition prior to the offense, and any revenue lost, costs incurred, or other consequential damages incurred because of the interruption of the service. Obviously, you see, it's going to be very easy to meet the uh, $5,000 threshold now if these bills go through. And another uh, interesting part is, and this is pretty controversial, and only one of the two bills have this thing, and this is about, they're trying to liberalize the, uh, uh, the trap and trace orders. And the way it works right now is if uh, the Fed want to uh, start investigating and working upstream trying to find out you know, who did what, and within each jurisdiction they have to go to the court and they have to apply for a trap and trace order. And of course, uh, if you're going through multiple jurisdictions, then it really, really impedes the investigation because by the time that they get all the way upstream, the information might be gone. It could be a delay of a week or so. So what they want to do is they want to be able to have sort of like a one-stop shop. So the, uh, the FBI or the federal investigators, all they have to do is just go to one judge, bam, you get a blanket trap and trace order to run anywhere within the jurisdiction of the U.S. And that's a, that's a pretty big one. And also what they've done is they're recommending for the damage threshold of, you know, the $5,000. What they're recommending is that if it's $5,000 or more, it's a felony. But if it's $5,000 or less, they're still going to be able to get you with a misdemeanor. So even though 
they have a much easier definition for the term loss. It's uh, going to be a lot easier to be able to prosecute. And another thing here, that under current federal law, the federal authorities are not able to uh, prosecute juveniles under any computer crime, including, uh, uh, well, underneath uh, 1030. And uh, what this would do is that the proposed bills is they would allow, at the discretion of the Attorney General, to allow juveniles to be prosecuted uh, for the more serious offenses. And the one thing to consider with this is, the, as uh, Eric showed, that uh, um, the recidivist or the repeat offenders can really uh, can get a boost, for example, if, they're, uh, if it's a one-year uh, penalty, if the repeat offender it goes up to 10 years. But what they're doing with uh, the juveniles is that uh, it'll count, to, uh, if you commit a crime when you're 14 years old, and then you commit another one at 20, that's going to be considered, your juvenile crimes are going to be considered as part of the repeat sentencing. And, let's see, oh, then uh, another one, this is uh, pretty important, is they are allowing, uh, uh, they're allowing the feds basically to confiscate any equipment that was used in the attack, so they don't even have to get any warrants for that, it's just part of the uh, statute. So. Okay, and this uh, final part of the talk has to do with what's going on in the rest of the world, and we'll get to what if Bob is in Iraq. Strange name, Bob, living in Iraq, but it could happen. Uh, there have been efforts to uh, harmonize uh, cybercrime laws internationally. Uh, the G8 nations met in Paris about a month or two ago, and this was uh, to the top of their agenda, creating consistent laws from one country to the next, assisting one another in terms of tracking down cyber criminals, uh, trying to make it such that there aren't any digital safe havens in the world. That is the goal there, uh, whether you like it or not. Uh, uh, we all saw what happened with the love bug emanating out of the Philippines, and at the time the Philippines did not have any cyber laws to deal with that particular uh, crime. And that caused quite a bit of uh, attention among uh, nations, and they've now been discussing things. Uh, this supposedly is going to be discussed further in Okinawa, uh, as the G8 is meeting right now. Uh, the Council of Europe is drafting con a convention on cybercrime, trying to uniform, uh, trying to create uniformity between uh, European countries uh, on this front. And there should be a report on December 31st. But if Bob is in Iraq uh, and Iraq doesn't have laws that deal with activities we've discussed today. Um, possibly Bob walks, and uh, as long as he doesn't show up in this country, he's not governed by the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Um, interestingly, I just read a couple blurbs this morning worthy of note. Uh, U.S. law enforcement officials, I believe yesterday, told the House panel that more than 100 countries currently still do not have any cybercrime laws. So these are the digital safe havens. Uh, also, uh, you've been hearing about Carnivore and the FBI. Well, in some ways, Carnivore has just been legalized and legitimated uh, in uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, legislation allowing the British, excuse me, the British government to track emails and to seize encrypted internet communications just passed the final hurdle in Parliament uh, this week. So, summing up, uh, you need to be careful out there, no matter which side you're on. Uh, as a lawyer, again, I apologize for that, but I have to say that this does not constitute specific legal advice. If you have any particular questions that pertain to yourself or others, uh, please do seek uh, counsel from somebody with expertise in your particular area of concern. Uh, thank you very much for having us today.